Well, thanks for being here, everybody. So let's find out what happened two months ago, almost to the day at the workshop that we held. Um, we invited some experts in this area, my colleagues, my friends, who have a lot of experience internationally, nationally in sediment management. And at that workshop, we broke up into four kind of teams and um, four ideas were generated. These are big picture ideas. Big picture ideas. And I'm going to report to you a summary of what each one was. The first is watershed and channel protection. The second is preventing sediment from entering the Niobrara uh, from the Niobrara. The third is dredging and the fourth is sediment sluicing. Now, if there's anything I'd like to emphasize today, it's what I've added at the bottom of the screen. And that is all of these alternatives must be supplemented with local dredging. We have to make sure that as we move ahead with a plan to manage sediment, that we address the issues of greatest importance to individuals, business owners and things around here. We can't lose sight of that. So, these are big picture ideas, but let's not lose sight of solving some local problems along the way. So let's begin by talking about watershed and channel protection. This was led by Meg Jonas, retired from the US Army Corps of Engineers. I worked with Meg for several years on, on sediment transport issues. She really knows her stuff. And so the idea is to realize, and, and I think everybody here knows this, that the Niobrara kicks in most of the sediment to Lake Lewis and Clark. There are other contributors um, shown, shown here. The Niobrara is the big one. So the question is, if we were able to better protect the watershed and stream channels, how much sediment could be reduced, retained in the watershed? And she gave an example from other parts of the country where bank stabilization can really prevent meandering from breaking down banks and contributing more sediment to downstream locations. So bank stabilization might be a possibility. Currently, I personally have no information about stream banks in any of the tributaries. I don't know what kind of shape they're in. Now advantages to and disadvantages to watershed protection. One is it takes a long time for th uh, results to show up. If you shut off the faucet 200 miles away, it's gonna take quite a while for a result to show up. Advantages though, the best advantage is we just feel good about doing it. And it's pretty low cost. If you can stabilize sediment in the watershed, that's about your least cost alternative. You've got some on-site benefits that will be helpful to landowners. There's a lot of existing programs out there. Water quality generally improves. Um, and this is from kind of a national perspective. Now, Meg did not have the opportunity of touring the watershed. She's not been in the Niobrara Basin or in the Sand Hills. And that's a pretty unique part of the planet. And it contributes a lot of sand. We're not sure how much sand can be prevented simply by stabilizing banks. Lots of landowners uh, have to be um, contacted and permission granted and all that stuff. Now, no matter what alternative goes forward, it's always a good idea to try to do better land management and reduce the amount of sediment moving downstream. We've seen in the 40s and 50s of the last century how ag practice changed and greatly reduced soil erosion. Well, how about version 2.0? Is there anything we can do now in these contributing watersheds to reduce the amount of sediment coming into the reservoir? So because this is relatively inexpensive, it's likely to be considered more heavily as you move ahead because why not? Personally, I don't think it will make a big difference, but if it makes some difference, then that's good. So that was the first idea that was uh, discussed at the uh, workshop. All 
All right, the next one was a dam on the Niobrara. And this is an idea that bubbled up from those in attendance. The idea, oh, John Shelley, by the way, is a civil engineer for the Kansas City District. And he is more active in implementing sediment management at reservoirs than anyone else in the Corps. They've got some projects that are very close to being implemented at John Redmond and Lake Tuttle down there. Uh, he's very innovative. Uh, he really knows his stuff. So uh, the idea was the following. Let's create a sediment retention structure. And, and he was fortunate enough to find one. This I'll explain what we're looking at. Mount St. Helens blew up a long time ago. Untold amount of sediment moving downstream. A dam was built across the Tuttle River or Tootle River, and all the sediment was captured there. I'm not sure what they do with it, but all the sediment was captured there to try to keep it from going downstream and ruining infrastructure, water treatment plants, intakes, you name it. That was a geologic event. So that's kind of what it looks like. Does that remind you of anything? How about Spencer Dam? That's essentially what Spencer Dam was. But the idea brought forth by a group at the workshop was to create another dam um, on the Niobrara somewhere that would capture the incoming load. How much load is that? Well, it varies, but on the day I personally measured it, it was 2,000 tons of sediment a day. 2,000 tons of sediment a day, that's, that's a lot of sand. Now, that varies with discharge, but that's what's been coming downstream for 60 years. So why not capture it uh, up here and prevent it from getting into the reservoir? Okay, well then what do you do with it? That's the big question. That's the challenging question for this. And for the sake of um, illustration, let's say that that sediment were removed and put into a truck and trucked away. How many trucks would you need? You would need 600 trucks every day from the day you started the project until the day you quit. And if you had 500 trucks instead of 600, then you're 100 trucks behind. That's the magnitude of the problem you're facing. So you can imagine some challenges to this. Advantages, the sediment is kept out of the lake. Yay, that's what we're trying to do. And it's a common tech, now it's not rocket science, it's a common technology, but, but, but that's essentially what Spencer Dam wants. Spencer Dam Reservoir was full of sand and it was flushed or sluiced twice a year and the sediment went down the river. What we're talking about in this alternative is taking that sediment and moving it quote unquote somewhere else. Disadvantages are fairly easy to identify. It's, it's really expensive. Uh, you're just shifting impacts to upstream. Maintenance, land reduces. It doesn't eliminate the growth. And then John's question at the end of his presentation is, where do you put a lake's worth of sediment? Well, there are, there are a couple of things you can do with it. You could trap and construct a pipe and move it downstream. That is technically feasible. It would be one big pipe to do so. And it would require pumps and stuff like that. Or you might trap and pump to a barge and barge traffic is still the least expensive way to move commodities, the least expensive of all. Um, so if you could trap and pump to a barge that would help reduce costs. Well, that was the second idea that was shared at the workshop. And, and these are in an order that I hope makes sense. Now, when I get through this, then let's hear the questions and stuff, okay? The next idea was dredging. This was shared by Tim Welk. I had looked forward to meeting Tim for more than 10 years. He was mentioned by name in a paper that Howard Coker and I and Dennis Johnson wrote about making this reservoir up here sustainable. Uh, Tim is really innovative. So uh, he talked about dredging. And it's well established, it's, it's used all the time. The Corps of Engineers knows how to do this. They dredge more material than anybody else by far. That's to keep the navigation channel and harbors open in the United States. So dredging technology has 
some space to move and grow. But the idea here would be to use an existing and proven technology and continually try to develop the technology so you can move more sand with less money. It's scalable. And as I mentioned at the outset, no matter what plan might be eventually adopted, we need to remember the needs of our local folks who have local issues that can be solved at least temporarily by dredging. It doesn't require a lot of water and what you see is what you get. It's expensive. Now we have an advantage here that the sand out there in the river is clean, meaning it doesn't have any known contaminants. That's nice. And there's very little large woody debris because of upstream dams. That's nice. But um, have you seen the Phragmites growing on that exposed delta? That was a shocker, it would shock me because I'd never seen photos of the vegetation growing. So that could be an issue. Tim says, if you catch the Phragmites early enough, the dredger can chew it up, but after a while, can't. Well, then the great question becomes like with the previous alternative, what do you do with the stuff? Okay. With the lighting in this room, uh, I'll, I'll explain what we have here. This is the front of the delta. The delta has been moving down into the lake over the decades, and, and this is kind of the front. We took a little boat trip out there, and you could have reached out of the boat with your hand and touched the bottom. So the idea is to work at the delta front. Up here is covered with such dense phragmites, it may be prohibitive. Now, um, the idea that was discussed at the meeting was, what do you do with the sediment? You move it downstream from the dam. So the reservoir is up here to the left of the screen. Gavin's Point Dam is here with the discharge. And there are two red lines that are hard to see here. One is a discharge point um, here. And the other, I, I can't even see. But anyway, there were two ideas for moving that dredged material downstream. Oh, great. Oh, thank you. So the first one comes out here, the next one here, far enough downstream so as not to interfere with the discharge of water from the dam. And then the idea is that the Missouri River with its clean water has energy to move that material downstream. Its ultimate fate, we don't know yet, Modeling studies are being carried out by various districts of the core, depending on where they are on the river, to find out if the stuff would drop out or keep moving. But that's one possible sediment placement site. Now, in kind of a plan view, uh, here's the idea. Um, sorry. You dredge at the face of the delta, put it in a barge. The barge goes downstream and either downloads to a pipe or lets go of the sediment in front of the dam. There's plenty of space in front of the dam for sediment. That's what it was designed for. And there's plenty of space where, there where sediment could be stored. Then the barges just return upstream and you go like this, kind of a barge train. So the dam might be a temporary holding location um, for sediment to be piped around the dam or later sluiced through the spillways. All right, so that's dredging. Now, another idea that was presented at the workshop is called sluicing. What, what is sluicing? I'll, I'll show you a drawing here in a moment, but the idea is to draw down the reservoir sump, lower the water level. As the water level goes lower, the velocity of the water going over the stream bed increases. And that's sufficient to scour the stream bed and carry that sediment forward. In other words, let nature do the work instead of a dredger or a truck. Okay, so I'll explain this. The top drawing is about uh, sluicing. And this would be an elevation view. These are the tainter gates at Gavin's Point Dam. 
they would be partially open. The idea is to have the area behind the dam full of sediment. How does it get full of sediment? It would be barged there. And once the uh, reservoir level at the stream bed is high enough, then when you open the tainter gates, the water will scour the sediment and move it downstream to the Missouri River. This is called sluicing. And the name comes from our irrigation. Thousands of irrigators use water and they sluice it into their uh, fields, right? A gate where the water is, uh, is still retained upstream. Now, there is a cousin, a relative of sluicing called flushing. And that's when you fully open the gates and you just drain the reservoir completely. We're not talking about that. We're talking about sluicing here. And this could work for Gavin's point, especially if the sediment were near the gates to begin with. Now, in a cross-section, that is, we're now looking up or downstream in the reservoir, this loosing operation would not remove sediment from the entire channel. It would create an erosion channel like this. It would go all the way through the delta and provide a path for water to freely flow downstream during that sluicing operation. So it doesn't completely empty the reservoir of sediment. Here's another elevation view drawing that shows what we would be looking at. Now, flow is from the right to the left. This is the dam right here. This is a scale in miles above Gavin's Point Dam. The present stream bed, shockingly enough, looks pretty much like this red line. Now this scale is quite compressed, so this is 10, 15 miles. Under sluicing, the future profile, if this were done, would be like this. You would gain this lake back, and there would be the incoming sediment would be sluiced downstream. So what does that mean? During the sluicing operation, the water level in the lake would be dropped to maybe five feet above the gates, the gate elevation. For those of you on Zoom, this is going to be tough. There's a, there's a picture here on the wall that shows us what it would look like. Here is Gavin's Point Dam, and here is the existing reservoir with the delta as it's moving into the reservoir. If the water surface were lowered in order to sluice water downstream, then the size of the lake decreases to approximately, that looks pink to me, uh, to this pink water surface area. During that sluicing, this is what the lake would look like. After sluicing, then you get the lake back. Greg showed in a drawing a kind of a conceptual idea of what that channel would look like. Again, it wouldn't be removing sediment from the entire reservoir. It would be creating a sluicing channel here sediment would still be deposited on the sides. Okay, you get the lake back, the water level goes up and down. Normal pool here, sluicing level here. Here's where that sluicing channel would be, maybe about a thousand feet wide. Okay, the advantage, nature does the work. You maintain open water, you stabilize the position of the delta, you can move a lot of sand downstream, relatively inexpensive, but this assumes that the sediment is already at the dam. Now, I'm gonna go backwards for a moment to this slide that shows the sediment having been delivered to the dam by a barge train and ready and poised to be sluiced downstream. Paul, who unfortunately can't be with us today, has checked with the hydraulic experts within the core that operate sluice gates like this. Of course, there are worries, there are concerns. And it reminds me of when I learned how to design a spillway. And we knew design a spillway, you depend on water 
coming um, up from the bottom and going out, up from the bottom and going out. Well, if there's sediment there, it can't do that. So uh, we don't know. If this idea moves forward, that's one of the first things they would check. And if the court said, no, under any conditions, this will not be allowed, then that's done. So um, that note right here, I added last night, and it's breaking news. So that will be um, developed in the future. Okay, well, those are the ideas. Uh, the disadvantage is that uh, from a fisheries and recreational standpoint, that pink area is pretty small compared to the rest of the lake. And so there would be losses in recreation and unknown impacts on fisheries during sluicing. Water supply intakes might be impacted. For example, if anybody is withdrawing water up here during sluicing, the water level will drop. And it might require a modification of the hydropower intake because they don't want all this sand going through the turbine. So they might have to design some exclusion to keep the sand from going into the turbine. Okay, that's what was discussed um, at the workshop. These are difficult ideas, aren't they? They're complex, likely expensive, they're big picture. That is an attempt to do sediment management of the system here. Now, um, let's uh, see what questions or discussion there might be, and then let's bring up Paul's uh, PowerPoint. Yes. Ron, uh, has the Corps done any determination of how much, what the level of the existing sediment at the dam is relative to the steel skates? In other words, how much space is in there? The question is, has the dam studied how much space is available for sediment storage at the dam? They do know the elevation of the sediment at the dam, but the information is probably uh, more than a decade old. But there hasn't been much deposition down there. They would they would want to upgrade that. Yep. Take a new survey. Yeah. Yes. Are we correct in understanding that the sediment? drops out as soon as it reaches a larger body of water where we reduce the flow. And on the map you're showing on the south wall there, uh, I can see it widen out to the same width as the lake is right now. Yeah. And so it's gonna drop out, it'll never make it, form a new delta there if they do that and it won't even make it to the dam. Um, so the question is, if the sediment drops out as soon as the water slows down, which is true, then the sediment will never make it to the dam. Um, that's almost true. In another hundred years or so, the sediment, without us doing anything at all, will make it to the dam. So I mean, if you're going through some sluicing, and you're sluicing, you end up having a map like you see on the right, unless you have a channel that are uh, something that carries it and narrows it and takes it all the way through, like you were showing on that one slide over here, East wall, unless you have some place where you can narrow it, unless you narrow it and dig that through new at the bottom, the deepest part of that lake is on all the channels, 50 foot out in front of the marina, at the top part of the path there on the lake. And it's up as you go up, it goes up until you get halfway or three fourths of the way to wide up, and it comes back across the so your point is that because this uh, water surface is wider down here, the sediment itself will drop out of that and never make it to the lake. Drop out and create another delta there. Under this here, unless you have some channel or weirs or something to channel it through, all the way to the dam, all the way to the spillway. Right. So under a sluicing condition, the idea is that the sediment would be transported there by barge. Well, I thought he was saying it would be transported and transported when I listened to the video, stored and transported with the water that's coming down once you drop, once you increase the velocity. And as you drop the lake, it take it a week to do it, it take to clear, clear out the sediment up above. That assumes that those comments were by Greg. 
I remember when he made those comments. And, and so let me clarify two things. The sediment, if barged and dropped down here to an elevation of the, of the sluice gate, when the sluice gates are open, that sediment will go because it's already there. Now, as that sediment is sluiced, it will erode upstream like this. Um, but it depends upon sediment being delivered down to the dam. You have to have your sluice all the way to the bottom of the river. Yep. The bed, which is approximately 20 foot down all the way across. Until you get near the dam, then it goes to about 50 foot of deep again. Right, right. So, so they would have, if they, if they could set up a siphon there, where it would spill from the 20 foot to the 50 foot, you have 30 foot of draw, the weight of the water going through, if you'd set up a siphon to take it out right there. You could. So uh, Butch is suggesting perhaps the use, use of a siphon to help out. And that's a possibility. A number two. So, so these ideas are in the beginning stages, right? Big picture ideas, details to follow. So if this idea, for example, were recommended for further study, then all of these detailed questions would be answered. Well, you can, I think Jeff pointed out one time there are some smaller lakes down in Nebraska where they're using, they were using the siphon to bring some of the separate through. And uh, they had capitation where it stopped the water reached the high point of the discharge on the site. That, that was at Grove Lake, North Fork, Verdigree Creek. I was the person who did that work. We were successful for a while. For seven years. We were 50% of the sand, like two ton a day coming in. And we were yeah. successful in moving one ton. And you know, capitation problems, water loss. Right. They're doing um, that right now at the fish hatchery. So they draw their water out. So the Lewis and Clark goes up over the dam back down and they have the pump house at top to take the take the air off. I'm I'm glad to hear that. That project at um, Grove Lake was really fun experimental scale it moved one ton per day remember the numbers we're working with two thousand tons a day the flow in that pipe was probably two cubic feet per second we're talking about thirty thousand feet per second so um this is a big problem but you bring up really good points you had an item also yeah uh, i thought of this after the uh, workshop in may on, on my way home is there enough of a gradient change from the upper end of the lake to the face of the dam for sluicing even to be a viable option? Has I don't that, know. Has that been looked at? No. Because it's the upper end, it was shallow from the beginning. And is there enough gradient to push it? Yeah, I don't know. Good question that needs to be answered. Some of the questions are fun to answer because they're in technical in nature and, oh, let's, let's get at it, you know, but other questions are really hard. Yes, Jeff. So just, just for clarification, a couple of points. The, the one graph you had up there, the illustration of the, the reclamation basically into the lake uh, after sluicing, to me was a little misleading, although you did say that's the channel. That graph kind of makes it look like, oh, you get the whole lake back. No, you get a thousand foot white channel. Right. right. It's, it's not the whole lake. So, right. So I think people have to keep that in mind. It's not, it's not getting the whole lake back. And then the, the other thing for clarification, you, you mentioned you mentioned sluicing gates at Gavin. So you talked about the tainter gates. The big gates, the big tainter gates, the big and, ones. You know, in the past there's been some discussion on perhaps adding some lower level sluice gates. That's right. That, that might improve the process that's right uh, because it's as we all know it's 28 feet down now to the gates right and there's 50 to 60 feet of water out in front so even with the barging you have to fill that in first right to no deeper than 28 and then and and i understand that my next question then is okay if you get that filled in with with transporting it down on the barges do you need that severe of a drawdown 
once you open those gates to move that sand if it's already being piled in front of the gates is it possible right. without draining the lake like it is there and and creating a new delta within the lake if that scenario could happen, then rather than transporting the sediment down to those two red lines you showed, it would come right through the gates immediately and then fill in the gates with the wrong gates. So that might cause some other issues with the pool. Let me start at the end of your question and clarify for those on the web as we go. 60,000 CFS would not be used, likely closer to 30, 35,000 the normal discharge. Which is what we got now. Okay, right, right. And the question is, is it possible to achieve sediment sluicing through those tainter gates without having to reduce the water level to such an extreme low level? And the answer is maybe a pilot project would be a great idea, wouldn't it? Numerical modeling can also help us out and answer that question, but it has not been looked at. Here's what has been looked at. If you wanted to do what we have described here without putting sediment behind the dam, that is trying to get the sediment from the existing delta all the way through the reservoir and over those tainter gates, it would require more than 100,000 cubic feet per second and it would take several years to get that sediment down to the dam. Down, downstream impacts were not analyzed as part of that study, but you can just do the math, okay? So um, you also mentioned, it has been discussed about these tainter gates at uh, Gavin's Point. Fortunately, they're encased in concrete. What about lowering some of those gates and then more effectively moving sediment downstream? Is that technically possible? Yes, it's actually been done elsewhere. In Japan, on the Mimikawa River, there are three hydroelectric plants in a row. The most downstream dam is called Saigo, and that one has low level outlets. But the middle and the upper dams in that series of three did not have low level outlets. And they filled up with sediment, somewhat like Spencer and was reducing flood control, hydroelect hydroelectric capacity. So the utility, which owns the dams, they at great expense, took a couple of the gates, tainter gates, and lowered them a lot. So now when a flood comes down the stream, they can open those gates and simply pass the water downstream. So it has been done. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, stuff in that question, Jeff. Did I get to most of it? Okay. All right. More questions and discussion. Oh, and by the way, I don't mean to defend any particular point just to explain it. Okay. Yes. Well, I think the normal pool elevation on the lake is around 1206. Um, what would the pool elevation be when you draw it down to represent pink area on the, on the map on the south wall to give us an idea of how much drawdown we're talking about? Yeah, normal pool elevation is about 1206. The, the Tainter Gate's about 1185. So that pink area is a lake level of about 1185. Which is the, which is the average depth of the lake, I think, 20 something. Yeah, the depth would, would get a, a, a lot shallower, that's for sure. About a foot a mile, like going up. During the sluicing, you have a deeper channel, like the skinnier part going through the lake part, right? And then like a depth of three feet on either side. Yeah, let's see if I can bring that slide up again. This is one view of it. Um, this is farther upstream uh, through the Delta. Let's see if I can get this one. This, this also is located at the Delta and it shows that you would not be clearing out sediment from the entire width. But in this channel that is created by the faster moving water as a result of the water level being lowered through the reservoir, this is what that sluicing channel would kind of look like. 
That's about how wide it would be. Now, these channels also can be helped along. Uh, they can be um, crafted, carved uh, through existing sediment and helped along. This has been done on the Elephant Butte Reservoir owned by the Bureau of Reclamation. The delta in that reservoir was so severe that water could not make it through to the reservoir. And it was flooding everything locally. So they went in and dredged out a river through the delta just to get the water to the reservoir. So these things can be coached as well. So in this case, or our case, to get that channel for sluicing would have to be done by dredging? Well, the sediment would be delivered down here and the water level lowered and the sediment passed downstream through the changer gates. As the water level lowers, then it is able to scour more sediment because the velocity is higher. But Larry, for this particular channel, um, unless you did this sufficiently long, this would not develop by itself. It might have to be created, as was mentioned by Butch. Uh, Paul Boyd has actually uh, thought of this idea, and his idea has a nickname. I don't remember what it was, but his idea was to create a channel through the whole thing. Um, yeah. yeah. We talked about that. In that small channel where it ends would extend to the delta. Yeah. Upstream of the original reservoir, could it look generally like it does now? Yeah, the idea is to, to uh, extend this channel so you have more of a sluice way here. Now, this slope would still be very flat, and we haven't looked at the energy gradient, if it's enough to keep things moving. I haven't looked at that yet. But the, 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 big, the big idea here is to have nature help out. That's the idea. Yes? Pre-dam, the river had enough gradient to move sediment downstream. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to reestablish that same type of a gradient if you're going to move it with very little energy cost. Then you hit the dam, but then you have to take it up and out because as soon as the water level builds in that channel above the level of the channel, you've destroyed part of the gradient effectiveness. Right. right. And I've had a thought a long time ago, and I used to take a 35 foot diameter pipe to handle the flow. Yeah. If you went to the face of the downstream face of the sediment, and put in a 35 foot concrete enclosed channel to the dam, put that stuff into a, what do you want to call it, a caisson at the bottom of the dam and constantly pump to maintain that level. It's a concept that I'd love to play with, but I don't think it's practical, but that's an idea of what would have to be done if you're going to maintain a sediment flow in that reservoir equal to a pre-dam effect, right? Yes. So that's the difference between Grove Lake with a six-inch diameter pipe and here that would require 30-foot diameter pipe or something. Mm -hmm. By the way, this has also been done, but in a little bit different format. In Japan, their dams are built in very mountainous and hard rock regions. And in about half a dozen cases, they've excavated a tunnel next to the reservoir that goes all the way around the reservoir to the downstream side. They intercept the sediment before it enters the reservoir and pass it through the tunnel downstream. If they don't do that, they don't have a dam. Without the dam, they don't have flood control and hydro. So they're facing these decisions much faster than we are here. Yep, so there's, there's questions to be answered about feasibility. And that's kind of what the, uh, this phase three would be. Ideas that are passed forward into phase three, all four of these or more or fewer would be looked at in greater detail. And fortunately, I would be there looking over the shoulder of the core uh, to, to watch. So yes. So 
the, the do nothing scenario, the lake eventually fills in. Yeah. So what what change, what improvement, what difference in in moving the sediment intentionally to do the sluice sluice? What what advantage is that uh, compared to the do nothing scenario? Is in the do nothing scenario, isn't that kind of where you end up? Yeah, in the do nothing scenario, the dam would likely have to be removed or decommissioned. Uh, there'd be no hydro, there'd be no benefits. Um, and the Corps hasn't had to face this yet with their 500 plus dams, but they would have to decide what to do. Now at Spencer Dam, what started to happen was that dam was sold or it was in the process of being transferred and the failure occurred before the transfer was complete. So the do nothing um, really means everything becomes uncontrolled uncontrolled. And you know, we don't like that word. The core certainly doesn't like that word. I don't really like that word when we talk about sediment passing downstream in an uncontrolled way. This sluice, um, this tainter gate sluicing idea, everything is controlled. So ideally, you're left with the storage capacity when you're not sluicing, which might be 11 months out of the year. Right, yeah. You would still have a lake with sluicing. The do nothing is you don't you don't have a lake anymore. Now that takes a long time. I guess a hundred plus years into the future. What a perplexing problem. What are we willing to sacrifice now for a hundred years in the future? That question gets answered all the time, but it really comes to light here. That's that's a really good question. Okay, most of the questions have been directed toward this sluicing um, idea. And to summarize, we don't have all the details yet. Conceptual idea, if this one were to move forward, then it would be looked at in more detail. But the core is concerned about uh, putting sediment up to the elevation of the tainter gates. Um, they've provided for sediment storage at the dam. That's no problem. It's provided, it's just not been used because the sediment is dropped out upstream, not in front of the dam. But they're sediment storage area wasn't envisioned to go up to the tainter gates. That's the initial, yeah, the initial feedback that we've gotten seems like they prefer more of a natural way of doing the sediment. Is that your understanding? Uh, a more natural, I don't, when you say they prefer, what do you mean the core? Yeah. So they Since this is being recorded for posterity, I won't comment on that. <laughs> yes. How important is it to stop the sediment from coming out of the night here? How important is it to stop the sediment? Well, we could answer that question by saying it's really very important to stop the sediment from coming out of the Niobrara. But the reality is you can't stop the sediment from coming out of the Niobrara unless you are prepared to do something with the sand. It, it drains the sand hill, several thousand square miles of just sand. And I've had the opportunity of being out in the sand hills in Plum Creek and out west and in the middle of nowhere in Dunning, and the sand is going to come. It's going to happen. It's the sand hills. And so it would be important to stop it, but you can't stop it. You, 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 could, you could stop it for a couple of weeks, but then you've got a mess on your hands. Now, to give you an idea of what this might look like, we could go and take a field trip down to the Loop River. The Loop River in Nebraska has a diversion dam that moves a lot of the water out of the Loop River and into a canal that runs probably 20 miles to a, to a power plant and then is released back into the Loop River. When that was uh, contemplated, they knew that sediment would come with the water that they're diverting. And so they designed a detention basin about a mile long to collect the sand. And 
the idea was then to flush that detention pond back to the river. And the project was built and opened and the detention pond immediately could not function the way it was designed. They have continued to divert the water out of the Loop River and all the sand that comes with it, but now they mechanically dredge um, the sand out of the detention pond and pump it up to the side of the canal. The pile of sand along that canal is so large, you can see it from space. And it's been sitting there for 50 years. Now, in the last 10 years, that sand has been checked. And the idea was, hey, well, maybe this sand fits the quality required for fracking. The fracking process uses a lot of sand. They tested it. It works. Uh, they'll never remove all the sand, but at least they're recovering their money required to remove the sand. Uh, now that they have a sand processing plant now uh, up there by the power canal. That'd be a fun field trip. I've done it several times. The sand here has also been tested for suitability for fracking and found not to quite make the grade. So the question was, how important is it to stop the sediment on the Niobrara River? Really important, but can't do it. Or if you do, well, then you've got to do something with it. And we had Spencer for almost 100 years, and that moved sediment downstream. They had, what, twice a year flushing? Or twice a year. They learned a lot over the years to do so in a manner that would not impact fisheries. In the early days, they just cranked the gates open in the middle of the night when no one could see. Uh, but then, then they, they learned and, and they did it more moderately. But their pool behind the dam was minimal. Oh, always, always a minimum. Yeah. I've surveyed that myself before and after. And they move a lot of sand, but it fills up in another six months. Yeah. Yes. One comment I'd like to make, I think my idea of a sediment management plan when we started this whole process would maybe incorporate some of the techniques. Um, so maybe you're able to extract some of the sediment. Stopping the sediment coming into the Niagara. It doesn't have necessarily have to be an all or nothing type of option. It could be that you just move 20% of what's coming in, and then suddenly your problem becomes less in the Delta. Maybe that makes it easier to find a market. You only have to get, instead of getting rid of the two and a half million tons a year, you have to get rid of something that's much less than that. Right. So it is, it's likely that any plan that goes forward would be a hybrid of several alternatives. For example, watershed protection, bank stabilization. I mean, why not? Where it makes sense. Where it makes sense. Yeah, but you could decrease the 600 trucks a day to something less. Right. Okay, uh, go ahead, Sandy. Just one other thing. And if you've already got the sediment on a barge near the dam, Sure would. But people looking in from the outside on this area, and maybe elected officials, maybe others, they're going to want to be finding the cheapest alternative and something that can be employed at other reservoirs around the nation. Um, so collectively, we have to decide what's right for us. Yeah. Still, that's coming in, or when, when was it starting to be measured? I would imagine there's been a lot of land use changes because not all that long ago the sand hills were cattle country exclusively, and with irrigation that has changed. There's, I know you, you brought up that 
the river used to take care of that and I agree with you, but as land use changes, well, this might be the most sand that's ever been. The river that, yeah. when it took care of it, it was when the, before we put the Gavin's Point Dam in yeah. and it took care of it. Well, but the point, one of the points that when it really increased, it was back when uh, soybeans first went over $10 a bushel, mm -hmm. there was land put to the plow up there, broken up on the west and the sand land that should never been touched. And that has never shut, that spigot or that faucet's never shut off. They only had, they had topsoil that was two to three, maybe four inches deep. And once that, once I was broken, the flood came because when my, when I was a young boy, my dad built Wygon Resort. We used to go up the lake, up the Niobrara River, under the bridge at Niobrara River. We'd go up past Verdigree Creek and make the turn. And then we would come back down so over the years, then you couldn't get under the bridge anymore. Then they had to put another bridge over the Mormon Canal because it changed the channel changed because that silted in and they went over and shifted west to the Mormon Canal where this last bridge went out. Did that did all of that happen, what you just described before Gavin's Point was built? No, this is when Gavin's Point was built, Wygon was built above Gavin's Point on the Nebraska side. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then from there we go. It was for years. We would go up the river. We'd take an annual excursion up the river and up the Niagara. We'd go up the Missouri River. You go right. You go right past Springfield, and, and there was no delta, no weir. There was right. no problems right. there. But after uh, I was selling real estate at Devil's Nest at the time, and that's when back in the seventies when the soybeans went nuts. And, Interest rates went nuts and everything else. But that's when the set really started to go. When we're flying in with work and on Lake Mitchell, Mitchell with the change of the water development distance, you don't have to go in and put everything in to CRP. But if you concentrate on you know grass buffer strips and, and things like that, uh, certain areas will hold a lot more sediment to reduce erosion. Uh, projects that we've done a lot of erosion will come from you know i raise cattle on, on my farm out here cattle when it's hot like this they love being in, in the sure. creek areas and they know, break down the banks cause problems but a project we just did is put in by water tanks or well water it's a better quality water for the cattle they do better they gain more weight and it's a benefit for the landowner because the cattle aren't causing erosion in the most susceptible areas. So everyone wins yep. in that situation. We've yep. had a lot of great progress. Uh, we've done some on Emanuel Creek, Choctaw Creek, and a lot in the James River area. I think that's something that needs to be looked at, <clears throat> something you could do today. Right, right. And um, so for those joining us on the internet, they may not have heard hardly any of that discussion. Uh, the question began, I'm trying to remember how the question began, Dan. Uh, reducing sediment. When did the sediment start? Reducing sediment loads. Okay, okay. And then Butch talked about uh, his experience over the years. Whatever alternative gets looked at in more detail, watershed protection and channel stabilization will probably move forward. It just makes sense, right? And protecting hotspots really does help. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to figure out cause and effect. Soybean prices rise, farmers go right to the edge, and erosion takes off. Is that what, is that what has produced the sediment loads today? We don't know. Dan, you also asked, has there been updated measurements taken over the years to look at the changing sediment rates in the Niobrara? No, not one. I can tell you this, that the sand hills has a lot of sand. And for as long as we can imagine, there's been enough sand out there that the water has moved as much sand as possible. It can't move any more sand. That's called carrying as much as you can. And it's been that way for as long as we can imagine. There's that much sand in the sand hills. 
But to specifically, uh, Sandy, I'm not aware of any updates on erosion rates and such in this huge watershed. Now, as a result of the workshop we had, Meg and John and I were brainstorming together in the car on our way down to Omaha. And we thought, well, let's get a watershed inspection done. Why can't we do that? And so the Corps will do that this fall. The plan is to send up their, their person to tour the watershed and see kind of uh, what shape it's in, you know, good, bad, great, and get an early handle on that. Yes. Um, question. Uh, Rollin, this is Rick Spellman. <clears throat> yes, Rick. You, um, is there a terrific summary of things, by the way, Rollin, just wonderful. Um, is there any way you can suspend sediment using dredges, a combination of barges and dredges to suspend the sediment once you have your <clears throat> sluicing gates in place, maybe by retrofitting the dam a little bit? Um, yeah, the idea, Rick, I think you've got in mind, imagine if you can, a sand bed stream and something uh, moves that sand up into the water column and then boom, it's gone out the sluice gate. The answer is yes. All sorts of things can be done. And that would be another possibility to prevent a filling, backfilling that um, area in front of the dam so full. This is an idea that um, John Shelley is looking at for I think Tuttle Reservoir. The idea is to inject um, water uh, across the bottom of the reservoir at the Delta front. A lot of jets of water, kind of like a center pivot on the ground on the bottom of the reservoir. And that would suspend, in that case, silt. And that silt would become so dense that it flows under its own power to the dam. Now that's a little bit different than what you suggested of suspending the sand so it can go through the sluice gate, but it can be done. Sand is heavier than silt, so it's harder, but sure, yeah, it can be done. Okay, there's, there's um, yeah. Are you familiar with the project with, that was done on the Bad River, Fort Pier area? No. As far as land management? No. <clears throat> that was done a number of years ago. I don't know the details, but <clears throat> as far as the land management part here, uh, reviewing what was done there, I think the end result was about a 30% reduction in sediment movement. Now we're talking about different soil Right. Bad river than we are here. Right. So that may not work the same. That's a, that's a real interesting point. The Bad River, just its name itself, not the most positive one. And I'm, I'm seeing silt and clay. And water can carry silt and clay without diminishing its carrying capacity at all. They just carry it all day. Can't do that with sand. But uh, that's certainly a good point, Larry. And that will be reviewed for sure. Yes. And relative to that, how many of you got Google Earth on your computers? Take a look at the White River below Chamberlain. The sediment plume on that, and you can see it on Google Earth, extends miles, many, many miles downstream because it's a light ventinetic type clay that comes out of the Badlands. You can see it visually. Now, we were talking about the problem. When did sediment become a problem? off the Niobrara. The Niobrara sediment was always there. It's nothing new. Didn't matter if it was a smaller amount or a larger amount, it was always there. The river before the dams moved it downstream. It wasn't a problem for most people. When I worked for the city of Bismarck, they're at the upper end of, of Hawaii. Our intake from the Missouri River was not a problem, our water intake. We treated water out of Missouri. But once you slow that water down with dams and lakes and ponds, bang, you get a sediment problem. So this, the Niobrara is nothing new. Neither are any of the other sediment problems we have. Look at the stock dams up the West River in South and North in the Dakotas. 
Doug, as part of a farm a program to help the ranchers with the water supply, they didn't have it. The water up there is lousy. But what happened? They started to sell in. When the price of livestock wasn't very good, and the price of corn and winter wheat took off, what happened? They broke land that never should have been touched with a plow. And there you got the sediments that filled in most of those stock dams. It's just an example of what we're talking about. Before the dams, the river moved the sediment. It built Louisiana, the Mississippi Delta on Louisiana. After we built, we stopped that flow. And there's the problem. Now we have to deal with it. I don't know how I'd better to explain it. Well, that really puts it in a nutshell. Now, we have a little bit more information to share with you today. Um, I haven't seen this. Paul Boyd was going to join us, but he can't. He, though, sent a PowerPoint, and I don't know if it's narrated or not. All right, let's go ahead and reconvene and get going again. Uh, Tony, can you see if Rick uh, Spellman is still with us? And if Rick is still with us. I am still um, with you. He made yep. a statement or a question we'd like to bring back. Yep, I'm here. Yeah, can you repeat what you said before, Rick? There was a question, I think. Was that about the suspended sand? Well, some combination of dredging to suspend sediment that would be sluiced or down, moved down towards the, the dam uh, to be sluiced later, um, and dredging to create the channel that would, uh, would help accomplish some, some combination of dredging to suspend and dredging to create that sluice channel. Thank you. It makes a lot of sense. Is that what you had in mind? No, I was wondering if anybody else online has a Oh, thank you. Besides you. All right, Rick. Well, thank you. Now, we have uh, some other folks online. What questions or comments would you like to make? Hi, this is Michelle Cook from the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Yes. And, and it's I think the only question I have or comment is, you know, if those alternatives for the um, Niobrara River are moved forward, either, you know, the, the bank stabilization or the reservoir or any of those things, um, I assume that those will be you know, studied in great detail to understand what those impacts will be then on the Niobrara. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Right. I was just checking to make sure, um, you know, the, the idea of a reservoir or a dam on the, the Niobrara makes me a little bit nervous just because, you know, you'll be moving a problem from, from one river to a different river, essentially, you know, so I just want to make sure that they'd be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Hello, Ron. This is David Waterman with the School of Mines. And um, I was just curious if uh, you would be um, amenable to uh, taking email questions at some point in the future. I suspect that um, the questions that I have are probably too involved for what, what you want to uh, get into right now under the time constraints. Of course. Yeah, okay. that's a great idea. When, um, when a meeting is conducted, as all of you know, using Zoom exclusively, there's something called a chat box. And that's where people can type in questions if the audio isn't working very well. In a mixed mode like this, then that's a great idea, using email to um, ask a question that may be a little bit longer than normal. Uh, you should have uh, Sandy's email address for sure, just to forward your questions to her. Thank you. Well, Paul Boyd was planning on joining us by Zoom, but yes. Yep. Could I ask you to clarify something for us? Yep. When we had the long discussion on the sluicing, there was the comment was made about needing to move the sediment and store it in front of the dam in order to, to get it through there. 
So I'm a little confused on the sluicing. Are we, are we moving the sediment from the source to and through the dam for sluicing, or are we having to transport it with the sluicing method to apply barge or some other way and then move it to the dam? In the sluicing alternative, it would best be executed when the sand is moved to the dam to stage it by barge. And then only um, a pass, pass the dam through the sluice gates, the tanner gates. So then that brings up another point, I think, and that is that sluicing is pretty dramatic in terms of what it does to the reservoir uh, ecologically, for sure, uh, because of the major drawdown that goes on. Um, if, we're, if we're having to move it to the dam and stage it, and I think Sandy was alluding to this earlier, then why don't we just look at solutions to move it from that barge up over the dam at that point instead of dumping it there and then right. draw down the reservoir? Right. So the question is, as long as we're moving the sediment down to the dam, why stop there? Why, why not just get it past the dam? Now, when Tim Welp made his public presentation two months ago, he, he had that in mind exactly. And he had two different exit points for that sediment. The challenge is moving 2000 tons of sediment a day if you were to maintain a balance through a pipe. It, it's, it's huge, it's, it's, it's huge. It's a pipe whose diameter might close, be close to this room. It's huge, it's, it's just big. It's hard to visualize that. So that's um, uh, easier said than done, I suppose. Uh, but that would be the idea. Now, instead of a pipe, uh, Tim and I were brainstorming before the meeting was over. Why do we have to use a pipe? Why don't you use a conveyor belt? I mean, there are, con there are conveyor belts miles and miles long around the world in the mining industry. Why couldn't we just do that? No reason we couldn't do that. So that's, that, that idea is on the table. What volume of water is expected to be carried in this 35 foot dam? I don't know. I mean, I didn't know, I didn't realize the Niagara was that big. Yeah, so um, passive, passively moving sediment through a suction pipe, you get about 6% sediment concentration. If you help that by pumping sediment into the pipe, you can go up to 28%. Now, if you've got 28% sediment concentration coming out of the pipe, then you know the EPA and state uh, might have something to say about it. And that's, you know, those are other questions. So about, let's say 25%. So you need four times as much water as sand, approximately. Now, Paul was unable to be with us today, which is too bad. I really like Paul. I've worked with him for a, a lot of years. I've watched him progress in his career. And uh, what I like about Paul is he's not afraid to ask really difficult questions of his own employer. And that philosophy is right in the middle of what we're doing here. He is excited about doing an economic analysis that's different than what's been done in the past. Um, I really enjoy working with him. So in lieu of him being here in person, he sent this uh, PowerPoint presentation, it's five slides. Slides one, two, and five, you can actually read. <laughs> but slides three and four are very traditional US Army Corps of Engineers PowerPoint slides that looks like they put the entire dictionary on one slide. So I may not go over those in detail. So there's three phases to what we're doing right now and we're in phase two. Phase one was to identify the objectives, constraints, collaboration, and um, update project management plan. I'm sure that's not probable maximum precipitation. Um, phase two, that's what we're doing now. Develop a trend analysis for future impacts. This might be something they are doing because to your question, Dan, there's been no additional data collected that I know of. So maybe there's something going on that I'm not aware of. The solutions workshop occurred and um, uh, to leverage existing dredging analyses 
And then application of economic models. Paul's excited about this, so am I. Okay, then phase three is when we move forward out of phase two into phase three, that's yet to happen. Expand the technical analysis to consider these, these things. And then the end product, a detailed sediment management plan. What happens after that? We don't know. But phase three is to take these ideas and put some, some clothing on them, put some, some details around them. Okay, this slide is, uh, I, this is one you can't read. There's just too much, but we already know all the stuff on here. This is the problems that we're facing right now and the impacts. So we already know stuff on this slide. The objectives, I wish, I wish the font size were higher. There's a lot of them. Opportunities for project beneficiaries to participate. And certainly Sandy is doing a great job at this. Um, evaluate the volume of sediment in the reservoir. This, this um, Paul's a little bit disappointed that even after the bomb cyclone, funding was not approved to do a, do, a new bathymetric survey of the lake. Uh, he expected that to happen, it didn't happen. So there is no updated information on the impact of that bomb cyclone and the impact of a failed Spencer Dam. We don't know. Assess um, economic impact. Uh, we're doing, um, Sandy's working on some history, which will have good information there. This is the one we're really working on right here, these two. So the number two means phase two, and the number three means phase three. Identify beneficial uses of sediment in phase two and three. Um, what Sandy is most excited about and what actually might happen is that a pilot project be uh, proposed. I think that would be really exciting and that would be coming out of this objective. And then to develop the final plan and to somehow keep the stakeholders involved and committed throughout. Okay, what's going on with phase two? We had the workshop. And here's the four things that we talked about already. Sandy is compiling a history and lit review. That's more interesting than you can imagine. Uh, developing current and future outcomes. Um, an economic inventory is being, I don't know what this means. I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. And Paul could have helped us on that. I, I don't know what it means. So uh, that's kind of a disadvantage of not having Paul here. That were part of another study that was not published to my knowledge, um, but updating those figures. And then you have this economic inventory that can be applied to other management techniques in the future. But to demonstrate how it would work, they have these three dredging scenarios that they'll run through the economic analysis in phase two. And that study that wasn't published, is that publicly available? Do we know? Um, I'll have to ask um, Paul. It, was, it involved dredging. And then with this process, we're able to update it to current figures or current numbers economically. Right. OK. All right, I wish I could field questions on Paul's presentation, but I can't really do that. So um, Sandy, you are scheduled to give a brief financial update. Sandy, would you please? I just wanted to go over this quickly. So you see where we're at financially. Um, phase one, we're past that. Um, and this information is included in the bigger packet that was on the table, the project management plan. 
Um, but phase one that's completed, that was outlining the objectives for phase two, um, that was $24,000. Um, there's about $1,300 remaining that will show as work in kind, and we're able to do that in phase two. And the total estimated cost for this phase two that we just kind of saw a brief outline, um, that's around 215,000. And this is a 50-50 cost share with the core um, federally. And we've got phase two pretty much covered. Um, there's been a $55,000 payment made in January. Um, there'll be work in kind that's recognized. Um, most of that is with the Solutions Workshop, MSAC, uh, and stakeholders contributed to getting the independent experts here, three of them for that workshop. Um, and then, uh, let's see. And let's see. Question, yep. So mm -hmm. 55,000, whose money is that? Is that? Well, it came from MSAC. The total contribution that MSAC and local, local stakeholders needed to make for phase two is 107684 okay. um, And of that, uh, 84000 is so-called cash. And 55000 of that's all, already been made. Um, we're approaching around 20000 and work in kind where that's right about where we need to be. Um, and then there'll be another estimated cash payment of 30,000 to round out phase two. And where that funding is all coming from, approximately 50,000 has come from the stakeholders directly. Um, that's like the city of Yankton, Yankton County, um, Bonhomme County, uh, several local governments. Um, and recently $8,000 was just received from the South Dakota Community Foundation, and that's included in the 4,900. MSAC um, dedicated 50,000 to this effort, and that represents basically two years worth of membership contributions. And then we're still waiting to hear on those two items in blue on the bottom. Um, there's been a grant uh, contingent of $3,000 on whether we're able to get another other business entities to match that. And we have another request out there from another business entity for the for 5,500 um, from utility companies. So then we'd be right there at what we need for phase two. Um, phase three, we really don't know how much that will cost yet. But when we went around to the stakeholders to get their support for this effort, um, there was an initial pledged amount and a percentage of that has been used for phase two, roughly 30 to 40% of say like uh, Bonhomme counties. Um, so then there's a estimated 65,000 out there that the stakeholders have pledged for phase three. Now, there is a little ca caveat in there that we realize these are pledges of support. And we continue to need to make a good case to present, to continue on with phase three. So that's, that's why we need your feedback at this point um, and comments. So we're on the same page and we're after the same thing. Um, we're headed in the right direction um, with our stakeholders. Um, and really, um, if so much funding is available, that's all that's going to be available to use for phase three. So the scope can be adjusted um, to what funding is available. Um, does anyone have any questions about funding or? So tell me again of mm -hmm. these numbers, how much money is stakeholder money in those numbers? Yep. In phase two, um, it's the 49,000. Um, oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. And then that's really a percentage of the overall pledge. There's still 65 out there okay. that the stakeholders have pledged. So MSAC and stakeholders have each put in about 50,000 50, for phase two. Right. Okay. Yep, and then we're still waiting on these grants. Um, 
and we should know by the end of August, I'm hoping. Um, otherwise, that'll just likely we'll knock on some more doors in a combination of MSAC existing funding. But phase three, that's really to be determined yet. Um, the scope and cost. We anticipate phase three cost is going to be more than total phase two cost based on what we want to achieve. Right. It's if we were only looking at one alternative, it'd probably be cheaper. If we look at three alternatives, it'll be more expensive. Okay. But um, I would assume if anything went towards implementation, there's going to be a much more technical study at that time, which would be more expensive. Yeah. Sandy, does any of the phase two or three have to do with uh, economic impact? Yep. And, and not only dollars, but the parameters that you were setting for mm -hmm. There was it was a narrow set of parameters that the core had to begin with. Uh, Paul, mm -hmm. Paul mm -hmm. said we were talking about why. Right. That's that two that's two. Yeah. And that's what those dredging scenarios would be plugged through. Paul refers to it as economic gymnastics. Um, so uh, and it would go through their traditional way and then the life cycle economic way. Um, the invent economic inventory should be looking at benefits and costs in a wider picture than they have in the past. So they can consider things downstream and upstream of the reservoir boundaries. And that, in my mind, that was supposed to open, open the doors to other alternatives for sediment management, because in the past, dredging is too expensive. And it was always shut down. So if you look at the economics in a different way, hopefully more ideas are possible or management techniques. Have we in MSAC considered the amount of money we would try to provide for phase three and the month? Sure. Um, well, one of the things we've looked at and we have applied and were unsuccessful to begin with um, was with the Bush Foundation. Um, and that's still a possibility. We can still reapply for that. Um, but I think at that point, part of that picture and something we knew, do need to emphasize is that MSAC is concerned about all the reservoirs on the Missouri River and their futures. So I think if we were able to put together a sound application to the Bush Foundation, we would be drawing in more groups upstream and getting processes started there and giving everyone a bigger voice as we can. Um, tribes, uh, and it's, it's not easy to get everyone involved and um, continued involvement with this because it's, the, the comment I hear from different people is that uh, nothing's ever happened in the past. Why is it going to change? Um, this is just money down the drain. And that's, that's what we're trying to combat. In so that's where a pilot project of some type with mm -hmm. physical action, right. moving dirt, mm -hmm. would be a very critical sure. aspect. Yeah, and I think what comes out of phase two and phase three, well, one thing I've read with sediment management plans, you have to reassess things regularly because conditions change. Um, so we need to start somewhere and tackling maybe the localized issues, moving some sediment, making it, increasing the lifespan of the lake. Some things can be achieved right away. and. Um, some of these other answers might come later with these more drastic um, measures. Well, having gone through 12 local government budget sessions, it appears to me that it's essential that stakeholders zero in on these options that we're talking about today 
and feel positive toward something being able to happen as a result of one, two, three, or four of those, and thereby convince their constituents to provide money for phase three in mm -hmm. order for that to be accomplished. Right. And section 1179 that's on the back page of the financial sheet um be hard to read up here it's just but if you want to follow along i don't know if i can see that on the internet but i just wanted to remind people what a sediment management plan is about and it is in our project management plan um, that plan, I think, is about 35 pages long. It's not long by any means. Um, and there's also a timeline in there. Um, the timeline in the plan says we should be done with phase two in May of 2022. I'm not sure if we're still on that time schedule, but I would anticipate sometime next year, phase two would be wrapping up. Um, and we went through a little bit of this with Paul's um, PowerPoint, but we want to address the continual loss of project benefits to sedimentation, develop strategies to mitigate current sedimentation impacts throughout the watershed and minimize future impacts. And we're, we're wanting to mimic the goals and objectives of where to 2016 section 1179A. And there's several bullet points there, provide opportunities for beneficiaries and stakeholders to participate. Um, evaluate the volume of sediment, Paul said that. Um, identify preliminary sediment management options. We've done that. Um, 1179A specifically mentions including sediment dikes and dredging. I'm not sure what a sediment dike is, but. That might be something to channel the sediment down to the dam, I'm not sure. Okay, and identify constraints. Um, we did that during the workshop. I think that'll be ongoing through phase two. Assess technical fe feasibility, economic justification. We're doing that with the cost benefit ratio and the different ways of looking at it, environmental impacts. Beneficial uses for sediment, we've asked that that be included in phase two to look at that more closely. Um, and then to the maximum extent practical, use, develop, and demonstrate innovative cost-saving technologies, including structural and non-structural technologies and designs to manage sediment. And I think Paul maybe included that in phase three as well. Um, but I just wanted to remind us all of what we're trying to do. Um, and that a plan can include a lot of different ideas and techniques and not trying to attack the problem with one solution. Um, but that was basically what I had. I'll just put that up in case we need it. Well, thank you, Sandy. Thank you for being so transparent in what's happening. That really helps a lot. If you look at the agenda for today, we're now uh, into a discussion period, which we've already had a healthy discussion. Um, I'd like to raise this prospect of a pilot project because I'm not sure how that could get off the ground. Section 1179A and a sediment action plan, management plan, would require independent funding, funding that goes beyond this three-phase development of the plan itself. If um, a pilot project is proposed as a final result of this, you have your sediment management plan, and you still don't know all the answers even after phase three, so you do a pilot project 
then that pilot project would require funding. And I really wish Paul were available to answer the question if a pilot project were done, um, does it have to go through the same review process as construction projects within the core that uh, currently is backlogged more than a decade? Uh, certainly, certainly it couldn't. But I wonder, um, I wonder if we could, um, go back to these four alternatives and just ask for your ideas, what a pilot project might look like. So if we talk about watershed and channel protection, the question is what might a pilot project look like? And we've already heard what has caused some increased bank erosion and soil loss, and that's been commodity prices, whether for cattle or grain, and how that impacts what is what soil is broken. We've already heard from Dan about some successful efforts to curtail soil loss and erosion. I know we have a somewhat limited audience, but there is a lot of experience and expertise in the room. We will have um, a survey done this fall, but that person from the Corps is not going to spend a year in the watershed walking it, which would be nice to really understand the issues. So I'm not sure how much detail will come of that. But if we could conduct a pilot project on watershed protection and stream bank erosion, what might it look like? What might it include? I think the CRP would be a big part of that and availability of that. When commodity prices dip like they did last year, there was tons of interest in CRP, but no acres available through the federal program. Is CRP where you set aside it's acres? The crop reserve program, yes. Yeah. And then particularly incentivizing the most susceptible areas. It does little good in this situation to enroll acres that are not highly erodible. Right, and right. Ones along the stream and along, uh, along the river, those should be prioritized. Okay, so at this point, Sandy, I guess this is being recorded so we can take notes later, but um, I consider CRP. I used to go pheasant hunting in CRP lands in Nebraska. What a great place to go pheasant hunting. It's fantastic. Also, Ron, um, I think to do a pilot project, for, one of the watershed protection, we want to look at what the conservation district has already done. Um, it's a conservation district called the Randall RCMD, which is basically upstream of Shadow Creek there. And they implemented some conservation measures years ago um, where they did multiple things, grass buffer strips, uh, reduced grazing near streams, uh, catchment basins, uh, and it's been pretty successful. And they have a nice report out on exactly what they did. So if we're going to look at a pilot project to do this, I would suggest we look at what they did and see where and how we could do that. Yeah, Les Lebon was in charge of that. Wasn't Les Bond, yes. Les Lebon, and it was quite successful. Well, that's a great idea. Super. So look at what and learn from that. The other thing I think, you know, we need what would really be good, and we've sort of talked about this a little bit, is to really figure out um, just how much sediment is coming from the lower part of the basin versus how much is coming from the sand hills because I think it's pretty well agreed upon that a lot of that sand is coming from the sand hills, in which case watershed protection is not going to do a lot for you. But I think one of the things that we need to know about is how significant is the sediment runoff coming from the lower one third or so of the basin and then that will give us a better idea of how successful additional watershed protection practices would be. Right on, right on the money, perfect. That's good. 
Several years ago, I served on a committee that looked at sediment in the Missouri River from the beginning to the end. This was for the National Academy of Engineering. And one of the things we tried to do, but we failed, was to make a sediment budget. That is how much is coming into the Missouri River and how much is going downstream. We thought such information would be readily available. It turns out it's not. So the idea of really looking at the bottom one third, that's a great idea because you really can't shut off the sand hills themselves, but there is intervening drainage area. Great, uh, good ideas, very good. What about the role of the NRDs? What NRDs do we find scattered throughout the, the Niobrara? Are there, there isn't a Niobrara NRD that goes the, the entire length, but there's gonna be several that touch it, correct? Yeah, there's actually three uh, districts on the Niagara, the upper, middle, and lower. And uh, we're talking about the different, you know, uh, plans and stuff and sediment reduction. I, I know that those are all available for for those producers that want to take advantage of them. Okay. I mean, that's, that's all ongoing. You know, we have... Uh, rangeland management and different things it's it's all ongoing practices that are there um do they does everybody participate no uh, you still got the producers that overgraze that still you know get a lot of sediment coming probably off of there and others that do excellent job so yeah it's said so the work is ongoing it's just getting it all done is not a problem. And Meg knows that. That's why she said disadvantages lots of landowners here. Lots of landowners, for sure. Okay, so Dan, he says that there's a lot of existing programs out there that people can already take advantage of. That's great. Overgrazing is kind of interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine who is a natural resources economist, and he looked at the problem of overgrazing And the problem was that the cattle eat up the grass very quickly, fast. But to have that natural grass come back is slow. And in the meantime, invasive species come in. So he was looking at two processes, fast, removing the grass and slow, rejuvenation of the grass. He's a mathematician and he came up with this complex way of looking at it mathematically. So we realized Reservoirs fill with water fast, and they fill with sediment slow. The same thing we applied to a reservoir using, using an approach I, I hardly understand to this day. It was uh, pretty impressive. But your overgrazing comment really caught my attention. I'm, I'm a little surprised that overgrazing still occurs. Well, I mean, and it's, you really see it in years like this, where it's extra dry. I mean, the last three years, you really didn't see too many pastures that looked overgrazed, but you can, you definitely can see them this year. There they were pastures that were struggling before that looked fairly decent with adequate moisture, but you cut the moisture and forth and you get, get a yeah. more issues. Yeah. Very question, are there many tributaries to the Niagara throughout the watershed? I mean, would like smaller sediment collectors, I'm just using that as an example, on tributaries that maybe a landowner would be in charge of, so you're dealing with smaller amounts in more areas instead of one large amount in one area? There's, like I said, on, on the smaller tributaries and stuff, there's, a lot of places where they've done, uh, you know, small, I guess you'd call them erosion structures to keep erosion from happening because that's that's a problem too. They don't want to ditch through their their fields either or their pastures. So, I mean, some of that is done. It, could more of it be done? Well, of course, but like I said, then it's, uh, like I said, that, just looking up and down the watershed on the smaller ones. Yeah, there's quite a bit that's done. Is there some more that could be? Yes. Are they easily maintained or how they like 
Most of them are stock bags and, and they're designed with a life. And once they use that life, if the landowner decides that he wants more, he'll either increase the size of the, the structure or he'll clean it out and start over. So. so the Sand Hills is unique in another way. The number of drainage channels is very small compared to other kinds of landscapes, including those that are nearby. Anything through LUS will have dense network of channels, but in the sand hills, there aren't very many permanent channels for sure. Very interesting. Okay, um, if there's no more discussion on this, uh, good ideas that have come out. Uh, should we move on to the second one? My idea is to go through the four here. This uh, idea of a dam on the Niobrara, uh, at first glance, is 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 fraught with challenges. Right? Uh, is there is there any way to make a pilot project out of this? It's hard to build a partial dam or a little dam, but how about a pilot project? I had a different thought on this. Rather than put a dam above the old railroad bridge out into the reservoir and put sheet piling across and there's a couple spots you could do that about 1300 feet of sheet piling roughly 1300 feet north of the railroad bridge allow the old riverbed to act as the impoundment structure you'd have to stay ahead of everything else with the dredging position uh, Floating dredge would work in there. Uh, and that way, it wouldn't have as much effect on any landowners uh, on the river itself. Well, that's a very interesting idea. Let's see if I get this. With the bomb cyclone and the failure of Spencer Dam, the Niobrara decided to take a right-hand turn. And instead of following its original channel, it's, it's now in a different channel. Well, so that presents an opportunity what's in the old channel. Uh, could that be used as a sediment storage location? Um, is, is that where a sediment could be diverted to? What, uh, if, if I understand that idea, well, that, that's really interesting. Are you speaking at Spencer Dam, it's a new channel? The, the, the new Niobrara channel that went past Spencer Dam? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes. So that abandoned the old channel, right? So there's a portion of the old Niobrara channel that no longer has the Niobrara River in it. It may have some little bit of drainage. Where the bridge was. I suppose. I, I, I can't say from personal familiarity. It's cold. It's already cold. Oh, it is? Of, of Spencer Dam sediments? Oh, okay. All right. Well, here's a pilot project for this idea. There is a technology that has been commercialized. And, and, and it, uh, the company is called Streamside Technology, and they've spoken to you before. And their idea is to essentially put a pipe out into the middle of the river. Um, and and I'll, mis, I'll mischaracterize this. So I'll describe one way to do it, and then I can be corrected later. One way to do this is simply put a pipe out in the middle of the river going across the river put slots in the pipe and, and, and then have an outlet that's a little bit lower than the river. And, and that then induces some suction where water and sediment can get into that pipe and then go to that outlet point. It's free, doesn't take any energy to run it. And this has been commercialized. And um, I've just described to you basically how it operates. But, but they have come forward a couple of times with the idea of using that technology to intercept some of the river on uh, uh, some of the sediment in the Niobrara River. So a pilot project could be a, a smaller scale example of this and uh, see, see what challenges might ensue, including what to do with the sediment. Um, I remember seeing a demonstration of this years ago in Colorado, and the sediment was just piled in a parking lot, big conical shape of sand, 
And I, I, I don't know what happened to it after that. Uh, this is a technique that I actually helped develop in its inception in Nebraska. And uh, Grove Lake was one example. And we moved that sediment right past the dam. We put it where it was supposed to be. And we did that at a couple other locations in the state. Um, Minicaduza River up at Valentine is another location where this was done for a while. So a pilot project for this alternative might be to test that streamside technology. Um, further discussion or ideas about how to make this alternative kind of a pilot? I mean, I don't think there's any plans of rebuilding it. Is that correct? Or? Correct. Yeah. Um, basically, what MBPD had to do was they started working with FEMA to figure out what they were going to do. Uh, there was never any intention to rebuild the structure. Uh, they just wanted to figure out how or what they could have to clean it up. So FEMA's process was MPPD had to develop a plan or have an engineered study done on what it would cost to rebuild the structure back to its original or where it was. And then in doing that, they come up with a dollar figure. I'm sure everybody's heard about this $50 million to rebuild the Spencer Dam. Well, now MPPD is in the process of uh, working with FEMA to convert that from repair of the dam to, to clean up. And so um, the last discussion we had with MPPD was when they get done cleaning up, there will be no evidence that the dam was even there. And everything was going to be they're going to try and pull all the sheet pile, all the concrete's going to be removed, all the dike structure that's left is going to be cleaned out. So it'll be, there won't be any sign of that it was even there. So that's, that's where that's at right now. Um, when they're going to get started, well, I haven't heard anything. So. so basically the dam would be removed and in the vocabulary that I'm familiar with, that's called decommissioning. It's the same thing as essentially as dam removal. Yeah. Now, wouldn't it have been nice if when Spencer was closed, they started a bank account to pay for the eventual day? Yeah. I remember when I was a little kid, uh, my mom and dad opened up a bank account for me, uh, just you know, a couple of dollars. But the idea was to take advantage of time. And, and, and that's a practice that's not been done in this country. Uh, it is practiced in other natural resources extraction industries, mining, forestry, and things of that nature. Money is set aside to deal with it, but not in this industry. So when uh, we do the economic analysis begun in phase two and finished in phase three, We'll do something that really hasn't been done before, and that is to include the cost of decommissioning Gavin's Point, because that's going to provide us more money to deal with the problem. Well, that's an interesting, I hadn't heard that before. So remove the dam completely. But that tugs at your heartstrings, doesn't it? I've been to Spencer several times. I was there just as they finished up a uh, flushing event. And the operators there went out and grabbed some catfish off the bottom and brought them up to the powerhouse and fried them up. We had a great lunch. <laughs> so that, Sp that Spencer Dam goes back a long ways. Kind of sorry to see it go. Thank you for that question, though. All right, so kind of hard to scale this idea because a dam is a dam, but we might be able to test this streamside technology at a large scale um, and, and see what happens. Now on dredging, I would, I would uh, a pilot project is an example of something that you wanna scale up. 
But I would hope that what comes out of this is some real concrete plans to dredge at half a dozen or a dozen locations up here where sediment is a real problem. That's impacting economics right now. And certainly that could be included in a pilot project. Um, so I, I hope that we can begin identifying those with pins on maps and be ready to go. That is kind of shovel ready if the opportunity would present itself. You know, um, the question is, is there any reason why, let's say you've got a marina or a boat ramp or something that needs to be dredged out. So now you've got a pile of sediment that would fill this room. And Sandy says, is there, is there a way just to pile that on top of the existing delta? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and then you begin to create, and you've already begun to create a different recreational industry. Appropriate placement of dredged materials in the upstream areas could make strategic islands. Uh, we're talking about duck hunting and other things like that. You change your recreational model. So yeah, there's a lot of room out there to pile it on, so to speak. It also potentially create a different environment in that something that we saw after the 2011 flood was these huge sandbars that were created, some of them 10 feet high above the water level. And the thing that we noticed in monitoring those in a couple of years afterward is that when the sandbar is too high above the water level, the vegetation doesn't want to establish on it. Ah. So in until those sandbars eroded down a ways, um, we had some wretched sandstorms in, up and down the Missouri. Oh, Valley. yeah. Because as you yeah. know, up here, the wind blows like below <laughs> 30 miles an hour. In the All the time. And so you create very, very, uh, put a, a lot of sand into the air, basically, and create these sandstorm situations. So yeah, just to, as a comment, if we got those sandbars too high in the Springfield area, Springfield may be cleaning sand out of their doorways a lot. Right. On the other hand, if they were high enough, maybe Phragmites couldn't reach the water table you underneath. You eliminate that problem. <laughs> so this is called unanticipated consequences. And when doing something you've never been uh, done before, that's, that's the one that'll get you, unanticipated consequences. And you end up saying, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. It's harder to say that now with our predictive tools. Yes. Question. I've been working on this for a long time. I hear stories of we need sand on the Mississippi Delta because that way the growth there that happens there will slow down the damages from hurricanes. We need sand here, we need sand there, we don't need sand there. Have we got any idea of the impact of lack of sediment downstream in the Missouri River from the mainstream dams. So the question is, do we have any idea of the impact of lack of sediment downstream from the Missouri River? Yes, we've got a really good idea of that impact. The most local impact has been a lowering of the Missouri Riverbed level, but you, you, you know all about that, right? And that goes downstream, you know, 100 miles. That's the most immediate impact. On a larger scale, though, um, we're losing the Mississippi River Delta. The land is subsiding, which is kind of too bad. So it's sinking out of sight, but also it's being eroded away and not replenished. We lose a lot every day. And so that's a huge concern in New Orleans because, as we saw in Katrina, there wasn't the same vegetation protection downstream from New Orleans that there used to be. The vegetation growing on the delta of the Mississippi River used to absorb a lot of energy from hurricanes. And now with that delta shrinking, it's an issue. Now the seven major rivers in the world all have deltas and they're all shrinking. But then we start asking ourselves, why are they shrinking? And it's easy to point fingers. For example, it's easy to correlate 
commodity prices with increased soybean production that breaks soil that should not be broken and increases local soil erosion. By the same token, we can look at dams and say, oh, that's the culprit. The hundreds and hundreds of dams built on the Mississippi, Missouri have stopped sediment from moving down. That's the problem, if only they weren't there. It turns out that's only part of the story because in the 1930s and 1940s, 1950s, the Soil Conservation Service did a great job at introducing soil protection programs like contour farming all throughout the Midwest. And you talk about a dust storm from exposed sand, we've seen the pictures of the dust bowl. So that too has decreased sediment contribution. But, but I can't tell you how much is apportioned to each. Now, let's take the global scale. It turns out that there is a great demand for sand worldwide. Worldwide. And in some countries, um, people don't rob banks. They rob sand piles. They steal them. This is for construction and concrete. There's a worldwide shortage of sand. But just like everything else, you got to have it where you need it. And the cost of getting it from point A to B is the problem. Well, for Pete's sakes, we've got barges. We've got a nav system. Why not put it on the barge and take it downstream? You know, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities if we could get the sand down to the barge terminal. But I think, Roland, another thing to consider is I think the sediment load of the Missouri River at its confluence with the Mississippi. Mississippi is about 20% of what it used to be before the dams were built on the Missouri. So one of the, you know, one of the arguments we should use in trying to rid the sediment problem to Moose to Park Lake is that that sediment, putting that sediment back into the Missouri would be beneficial for several reasons to put back in there. One of them being the subsidence and erosion they're having down in the Mississippi Delta. But we also have to remember that it's not going to be just that simple because it, if you've ever been to New Orleans, and I'm sure you have many times, the Mississippi does not reconnect with its floodplain. It's, it's, it's levied and it's engineered to take that sediment coming down it and jet it out to the continental shelf. If you look at a satellite picture of the delta, you can see that happening. So they, they would have to also implement something where they start pulling that extra sediment out of the Mississippi and redistributing it amongst the Delta to help build it up because otherwise we just contribute more sediment to the Gulf of Mexico. I'm with you hundred percent and plans are underway. They're close to diverting a portion of the Mississippi river upstream from new Orleans to carry sediment load to redistribute it to the deltas. So what you recognized is gonna happen. It's been under discussion for 15, 20 years. So that's gonna happen. Now I'm a great champion of moving that sediment past the dam and getting it where it ought to be. And because the navigation channel is there, it's narrower, it's deeper, and it flows faster than it used to. So I think there's great potential for moving whatever we dump in a long ways. Now that's easier said than done because I don't live in Missouri. And there may be sediment dropping out in the Missouri River that would require additional dredging. There's also a principle at play. And that is that if you live along the river, you are not allowed to discharge sediment into the river. There's laws against that. Construction site, you can't move sediment into the river. So folks living along the Missouri really got mad when the Corps tried to do the right thing, and in my opinion, they did the right thing. They reconnected some of the cutoff channels in the Mississippi River, opened up the plug, dredged some out, opened up the plug at the downstream end. That provides great habitat in these side channels. But when they dredged that sediment, they just popped it right out in the main flow and it was gone. That made landowners really mad because they're not allowed to do that. So um, your point about uh, redistributing the set going to happen. The point about passing sediment downstream, I hope the next meeting we have, 
is not even here, but down in St. Louis, where we can see what people think of that idea. That those are great thoughts, though. It's right, right on the money. Hey, Roland. Nice to see if it's dredged once, it wouldn't have to be dredged again. Right. There is a reach of the Missouri downstream from the degradation zone where there is deposition. So that it could stop at some point. Okay, when we talk about dredging, now this is, this is the ultimate for pilot projects. Smaller scale trials, this could, be, this could really be tried. For example, we could try for a year, removing sediment down here and moving it down to the dam by barge and dumping it. Uh, I suppose a pilot project could even be made of piping it around the dam with a much smaller diameter pipe, you know, smaller scale. Wow, what a great idea because you don't know what obstacles you face till you try it. And the 404 permits, 401 permits, downstream states, nav channel, the navigation industry, they would probably have a lot to say about that. And that would be a way to bring, bring it out. So when you consider dredging, that's a, that's a real easy thing to scale. As Tim said in his comments, dredging is scalable. So um, I hope, Sandy, that as we move ahead, we keep this idea of a pilot project in mind. Now, uh, the, uh, the idea about sluicing Boy, I just can't think of a way to scale that into a pilot project. Can you repeat the question? Would does anyone have any comments they'd like to express in general about sluicing? The idea of sluicing or even flushing or what are your yeah it's a big it's a really big spencer dam piping where you're not pumping where you use the fall from where the the deposit is now from the headwater from the upper end of the lake and you you put a, a small pipe all the way down the middle of the lake uh, in the bottom of the lake and then you directionally bore it under the dam we bore it under the river for water i mean maybe this is only a 60 inch pipe or something yeah um, and then at the top of it you could have a stack with some sort of gates or valves and you can dredge and dump into the into the stack and then open your gates to allow the appropriate mix of water and flush it that way. David, I like the way you think. And uh, so often when considering ideas like this, the initial reaction we get is the knee jerks up and says, you can't do that. You can't do that. It's, it's a common reaction, but I like the way you think. And that could be a way to uh, do a pilot project. Likely wouldn't involve boring something through the dam, but um, even a small pump or smaller pump to get it around would work. Yeah. All right, now um, I'd like to uh, test your metal, not M-E-T-A-L, but M-E-T-T-L-E. -T -T -E. Is everybody up here ready to go? with the idea of a sediment management plan that can't be done for free and can't be done without impact. Now, the most obvious impact is this one about sluicing where on the wall over here, we can see that the lake area is reduced a lot if sluicing occurred. If sluicing occurred, it'd be a lot less than what you see on that one. It, if, can you, you were, if you were to use sluicing to force the sediment through the dam, to do that, 
you would have to count on the water coming through from upstream. Yeah, from Fort Randall and because the rest of this is just going to be setting off to the side. If right. You set up your, yeah, it will be just set setting set off to the side. Or, or, but if yeah. you're going to do if you're going to do that or set that up, why not run it from the dam? Run a channel like they do in Arizona for water out of the mountain. Run it all the way up to Never. Can be done. And you don't need a you don't need a pipe. You can do precast. You can a bypass channel. And and that particular idea is not yeah is not is not landed like a canal uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like a canal in Arizona. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the thirty five foot diameter of pipe would be needed. Yeah, I did a, a quick calculation, and you could do that with a sixty foot wide and sixteen foot high channel and get the same cross sectional area as yeah. you would with a pipe. You'd have to cover it. Be done in precast, but the board cast in place, but it's going to be a massive project. It's not something that would suit itself to a pilot plant. Right. Project. Right. So I'd like to bring up the the inevitable idea of the do nothing alternative for a few minutes. Because um, I, I am an engineer, and whenever we look at alternatives, the first one we look at is what if you don't do anything at all? What are the costs and benefits of that? So what if you don't do anything? We've heard Paul Boyd talk about the migration rate of the delta into the reservoir and when it might reach the dam. Okay, that's the mechanics. But you folks live with this. What are the impacts of doing nothing? Into the reservoir as we know it. No reservoir. Economic depletion. Economic depletion for the existing water-based recreation. No water-based recreation for housing, for everything else that's going in on the hydro hydropower. Yeah. Lots of hydropower. Right, hydropower would be gone. So what Cor has always said that that stays so even if the reservoir disappears. You know that's the that that's really um, in 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 my in in it's true, but at some point you lose that as well as you can't keep the sand out of the intakes. But hydropower is the last benefit to be lost. If the reservoir were, f that's all you need. That's all you need. Um, but eventual eventual loss of hydropower. Okay, so hydropower, uh, flood control, this, this reservoir doesn't do much for flood control. Uh, the core would lose the ability to regulate the water downstream for navigation like they do now. That's what Gavin's point does. But one, one mm -hmm. thing we got to look at, guys, back when these dams were conceived, the Flood Control Act of 44, Rural electrification was a gleam in everybody's eye. If a farmer had enough money, he had a wind charger and a battery bank in the back shed, right? Some of us remember those. Okay? Some of you are too young to remember those. Rural, rural electrification was a gleam in everybody's eye. When I was in college, 56, I worked for all type engineers and drafting, drawing plans for rural electrification. It still wasn't all done. Rural water wasn't even a gleam in anybody's eye. And now we have massive rural water projects. I was one of the engineers on the Minnie Washone project, covers one fifth of the area of the state of South Dakota, involves three Indian reservations and two non tribal sponsors. I was about heavy. But the fact is, none of this stuff was predicted at the scale that it is now. So the loss of any amount of water storage capacity to generate electricity is significant. And according to Paul Boyd's own figures, between electric supply and water supply, those two benefits make up about 70% of the benefit, total benefits of these reservoirs. The loss of one reservoir and it's a small one, it's not a big deal. 
but it becomes too easy then to say, well, the next one, yeah, we haven't figured out what to do with it yet, so maybe we'll decommission Fort Peck. Pretty soon you're talking about decommissioning as the primary goal. That's not the case. We have to preserve what we have. And we have to look at the fact that water use is increasing tenfold over the years. We just can't ignore that fact. And water quality is declining. Lake Mitchell. Right now, on Lake Mitchell in Mitchell, South Dakota, there's a no contact rule in place. Don't go water skiing. You may fall off. Don't go swimming. And that used to be our water supply. Right now we're getting out of BY. And guess where the BY water intake is? <laughs> south of Tabor. It's south of Tabor. Well, thank you for those comments. But the do nothing alternative is out there. And it's something that we need to look at. Our agenda is done. Sandy? Do they ever take into account mitigating like the water districts or hydropower? Do they have to find alternative supplies for that? Or is everyone on their own? Does the Corps need to do that? I don't know. Ask Springfield. You, you, you should know. You, you, I think you know that. Did they pay for your new intake? Did they help you do the engineering? No, I guess one. So, ex excuse me, guys. Excuse me, guys. Sandy's making a point about water intakes. Yes. Well, just, I mean, if at the point of decommissioning or when when a water district has to find a new water supply, they're on their own if they're in the lake. Uh, or in the Missouri River, is that your idea, Howard? Or? So here's the idea. When, when Glines Canyon and Elwha Downs were removed, each several hundred feet high on the Elwha River in the Pacific Northwest, all sorts of implications occurred, and the Bureau of Reclamation paid for all of it. They had to build new water treatment plants downstream, et cetera, et cetera. So there would be support to do that for sure. I think I, I don't know. Maybe Terry knows more about that, but there's, we have the rural water system in Nebraska, and I think it's the Cedar Knox rural water yeah. system that uses the lake for any places that are already looking for alternate water supplies to groundwater. And the here we're looking to not only find a different water source, but even each one is one of our options. Because we realize that our intake will be building the sand eventually down the road. So we're already expecting different water sources. So maybe. So, are you expecting that you'll bear that cost yourself? No, we, uh, we're looking at all funds possible from all the different you know, funding opportunities. So, we'll get enough money to. Water sources are tricky. You get into the sand hills, most of it is beautiful water. You get up into the uh, western South Dakota area above the sand hills, you've got water quality that isn't fit for human consumption according to the rules. And now, yes, we have forms of treatment that can be used, but they're very expensive. Nail filtration is one. But it's still a matter of fact that the Missouri River has been the primary water source for years. And in North Dakota, Fargo is now looking at Missouri River water. And you take Minot is now getting Missouri River water. They were on the Suris River, which Lord knows what they could. But they're getting Missouri River water. Bismarck, Mandan, they're on the river. And it's miles away. Dickinson, I think, is getting it. Sioux Falls. Sioux Falls getting it, but they're in a well. Remember, they're in a well in the aquifer. Right. Us, sir. That's that's uh, drilled in below the Missouri so water system. Right. Yeah, and they have wells that are stripped from the well to the river. 85% it, of what goes in the wells comes from the river. Yeah. So the point being that water use is only increasing, only increasing, and ever will.
EY is a, is a major, I mean, they're, they're their own rural water system, but they supply so many other entities further north with good water coming out of Lewis and Clark Lake. They're not that far from the leading edge of the Delta. And you'll never find another op an aquifer that will supply that kind of quantity and quality of water in the vicinity of where they're at. And you probably shouldn't. Well, I think when I said the agenda is at its end, that means that our meeting is at an end also. But um, Sandy and I are happy to stay and, and have further discussion if you would like. Um, really appreciate the ideas and discussion that's come out today. Appreciate your honesty and, and coming forth with your ideas and, and questions. Some really good questions that I could not answer. Some, we just don't have the data. Sandy? The comment sheet that was handed around it did have an old due date on it, but I just wanted you to have that and feel free to still submit comments. Um, there is an email address you can submit comments to that's listed at the top, comments at keepitwater.org that comes to MSAC. Or if you just want to frame some comments, you don't have to use this form, just email them to me, that's fine, or mail them. And for those of you who have joined us uh, via Zoom, thanks. Thanks for your participation. Hope you find it useful. With that, Sandy, I'm going to um, take off the microphone and go from there. Thank you very much.